start, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. Thank you for all the natural remedies that you've provided for us. And please guide my words and help them to be yours and help us to learn more of your truth. Amen. Amen. Okay, today we're starting with the wonders of water. So, before I proceed... I want to remind all you, since you all know me anyway, I am not a doctor. I am not a licensed medical professional. If you take anything I say and misuse it and turn it upside down and hurt yourself, that's at your sole risk. So, warning. Study it out for yourself. And I suggest if you need healing, see the great physician. Okay. So on into some hydrotherapy here. The wonders of water. Of all the eight natural remedies, even though I really like to eat, water is probably one of my favorites because it's changed my life a lot. And in the Bible, Exodus 23, it says, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. So water, God blesses to take away sickness. And interestingly enough, Another thing that water is good for in the Bible is giving to your enemies. So it's, it's good for your body and good for enemy protection. <laughs> hydrotherapy. Everybody here probably knows that hydrotherapy is made up of two words meaning water and treatment. That's all it is. Nobody would think to not water their garden and think that it's going to grow all summer long. But how many people don't water their bodies and think it's going to grow? Hydrotherapy is the use of water internally or externally for the purpose of treating disease, illness, or injury. And we're going to talk about the internal use of water first. In Daniel's miracle diet that I like to call it, he not only asked for pulse to eat, but he asked for water to drink. And we all know that that turned out very well, his 10-day test. Our body is about 75% water. Our brain is said to be about 85% water. It's really funny. I have to laugh a little bit because the more you talk about water, the more you see people start drinking water. <laughs> they start thinking, hey, just like other things cause disease, if you're missing them, water deficiency causes disease. If you have a vitamin C deficiency, you're going to get scurvy. If you have a vitamin D deficiency, you're going to get rickets. If you have an iron deficiency, you're going to become anemic. If you have a water deficiency, you're going to have heartburn, headaches, back pain, joint pain, hypertension, etc., etc., etc. One of the books, besides the Bible, that changed my life the most is this one right here, Your Body's Many Cries for Water. And this guy actually says, he's a doctor, he says, chronic and persistently increasing dehydration is the root cause of almost all currently encountered major diseases of the human body. And he goes on to establish that and give studies. This is Dallas, for all of you know them, my husband. And back many years ago, Dallas used to actually come home from work, working construction like this sometimes. He could not move, he could barely drive, and he was bent over double like this. And his back had gone out. And he would stay that way sometimes for three days. And then finally he might be up and around enough that he could go back to work and try to do some work. Until we learned about drinking more water. Now his sister is actually a physical therapist and he actually does have some injuries in his back. Um, where things are out of line and stuff. But what he has learned is that in between your vertebrae, you've got little cushions in there. And those cushions need water. They're kind of like little sponges. And if you don't drink enough water, that sponge dries up and your bones start rubbing together. And it's very, very painful. Now, after Dallas learned that he wasn't drinking enough water, that problem has ceased, except when he forgets to drink his water. And actually this happened probably 
I don't know, a month ago now, he forgot to drink his water. And what we did was we took a hot water bottle, put on the spot, and he guzzled tons of water. And by 15 minutes, he went from being bent over double, not being able to move, not even being able to breathe, between the, the hot water bottle and drinking some water, he was up and going again. So we've seen it happen over and over again. And you <laughs> see him go get his water bottle. He's learned that he can tell when his back's going to go out and that he needs more water. And you can keep it from happening. Now it doesn't just work for back pain. There'll be some other things we talk about. Another thing that we learned with Dallas, he actually could not drink orange juice. And he would always get heartburn. And he actually asked a doctor, he said, you know, why, why when I drink orange juice do I get heartburn? And the doctor said, well, I don't know. If, you, um, if orange juice gives you heartburn, quit drinking it. But he said, orange juice is a, a perfectly, you know, good thing to drink. Well, what we learned is that most of the heartburn is also caused by lack of water. Now, if you eat something really spicy, you may have another problem too. But most of heartburn is caused by lack of water because it's a thirst signal. Your body's saying it needs water to keep things moving. What happened after we learned this is we all got rid of our heartburn. The only exception that I have had is when I was pregnant. I did still get heartburn a couple of times. Joint pain. I like testing this on many other people. But first off, I tested it on myself. Because if you are come to my house and you are sick in any way, shape, or form, you will hear Dallas say, Drink more water. How much water have you drunk today? Well, probably two or three years ago, we were putting up a shop and I was climbing up and down scaffolding. And my knee went out and I could barely climb. And I thought, I'm not going to be able to do this all day. And so my husband said, how much water have you drunk today? I thought, well, I haven't really drunk much, but that can't be what's wrong with my knee, right? So I went in and I drunk, I don't know, almost a quart of water. Just guzzled it down. And guess what? In about 15 minutes, I was up and climbing up and down scaffolding again with no knee pain. I tested it again. This happened um, just about a month ago. My sister had been going down a bunch of stairs and her knee went out. And she said, you know, I've got this pain in my knee. It hurts really bad. And I said, how much water have you drunk today? Your knee needs water. And she said, oh, well. But she, we went and got her a bottle of water. And she drunk it. And guess what? About 15 minutes later, I said, how's your knee feeling? I mean, she could barely walk. Her knee hurt so bad. She said, well, actually, it doesn't seem to be hurting anymore. It must be a placebo effect. I said, no your body needed water and your knee was telling you so. And it's the same thing in your knees. You've got little pads in there that have got to have water. If you don't have the water in there, your bones will rub together and it will cause problems. Headaches. Probably most of you know this. 80% maybe more of headaches are lack of water. They're caused by dehydration. From the time I was a child, I had painful headaches that would basically immobilize me. We lived where it was very hot and I would get headaches. I wish I'd have known this as a child. I'm sure I was dehydrated. Since I've known this, I keep headaches to a minimum. Usually if I get a headache now, it's either from lack of sleep or being around an extreme amount of chemicals in the environment. So, but almost all my headaches are gone. Again, every once in a while, I forget to drink. And this happened about, I don't know, a month ago again. I went out, was working in the garden, forgot to drink, came in, had a terrible headache. And so I did the same, the same thing. Drink water, put a hot water bottle, wherever you feel like the headache's stemming from. That particular time it was kind of almost a tension headache too. Put a hot water bottle there. Gone in about 15 minutes from being neutralized, not being able to do anything, thinking I'm going to have to go to bed because I just can't function with a headache so bad to up and going again. So, 80% of headaches caused by dehydration. Drink more water. Remember that first part, 85% of your brain is water. So your brain's gonna suffer. It can also cause forgetfulness. 
if you don't drink enough water. And, and this doctor that wrote that book actually says many people that are diagnosed with symptoms of Alzheimer's, it's actually a lack of water. Here's another case in point that I learned. When you get a stuffy nose and mucus, you all immediately think, I'm sick, right? Well, maybe sometimes you're sick, but what happens is normally when you drink enough water, your body's thinning that mucus, and it goes down your throat without you even knowing it. But when you don't drink enough water, then your head gets stuffy, and you think you're sick. And I actually experienced this. One day while my parents were here, I woke up, my head was all stuffy, and I thought, I'm sick, but I don't have time to be sick. I'm going to test that theory that I read about this mucus thing. So I guzzled tons of water, thinking, you know, well, I hope this works, but I don't know. And guess what? It worked. I was up and going, and I didn't feel sick the rest of the day. It was gone. So even if you are really sick, by the way, with some disease, it will still help thin the mucus and make you feel a lot better. Sometimes I've wondered, when people take medications, is it the medication that's helping them feel better or is it the glass of water they're taking it with? It might be interesting to make a placebo pill that says take this with eight glasses of water a day. You know, <laughs> see how well it works. A lot of people like to drink um, other liquids, tea, coffee, alcoholic beverages, hopefully none of you do that but those are dehydrating, particularly the alcohol um, is very dehydrating to your body. It does not count for your water intake. In fact, I've heard that your spine needs directly plain water. If you, especially if you want it to work fast, you probably want to just drink plain water. Soft drinks. Soft drinks will ruin your teeth. This is one problem with many, many kids is they drink lots of soft drinks. Even somebody like Colgate has figured this out Soft drinks have emerged as one of the most significant dietary, dietary sources of tooth decay. And I used to see this when I babysat. I had kids come in with mouths that looked like this. When they were two or three years old, their baby teeth were rotted out from drinking soft drinks. And when I w used to work at a health food store, um, I actually did kind of my own little questionnaire. When people would come through and they had really good teeth, I wanted to know why. And so we'd start up a conversation and invariably, the people that had good teeth and no cavities were those that had drunk water as their primary source for their whole life. They just liked water. And some of them ate different things, but that was the main factor across the board. They all drunk water instead of other things. So, here's how to figure out how much water you should drink daily. Take your weight, divide it by 2.2. If you want to just make it easy, divide it by 2. That's the number of ounces you need to drink every day. So the heavier you are, the more you have to drink. And this, so say you're 120 pounds, you need to drink 60 ounces a day. Well, this is actually what caught Dallas because for him at 250 pounds, this means that he needed to drink about 14 cups of water a day, which is almost double the suggested six to eight cups of water a day. And so he was never getting enough water because he thought he drunk his amount of water for the day. So this is very important to use this to figure out how much. It makes sense. The bigger you are, the more blood vessels and everything, that the, the larger the system for the body to work through. You have to have more water. So once Dallas learned that he had to drink almost a gallon of water a day, it made a huge difference. If you're sweating, if you've got a wood stove in your house that's going to be dehydrating, if there's any other factors, you may need to drink more. Water will help both high blood pressure and low blood pressure, which is kind of strange because, but it does. Most people that have um, low blood pressure, a lot of times it's either a reaction to a medication or you're not drinking enough water. There's a, a Dr. Julian Whitaker that says if you have high blood pressure, which can be connected to heart disease, to drink, I think it's 15 cups of water a day, it will actually thin your blood, just like a blood pressure medication does, and no side effects. So drink your water. If you can't remember, line it up on the counter. Figure out how much you have to drink, and that way you know by a certain time of day, I have to have this drunk, this drunk, because if you get to the end of the day and you say, I have to drink all of that, 
it's going to be really hard to get it down. You've got to do it throughout the day. Actually, what happens, a lot of people's thirst mechanism is broken because they haven't drunk enough water and they don't even think to drink water. Especially older people don't drink enough water because their thirst mechanism is just so, so far gone. You have to mentally think, I have to drink water. Here's a good way to tell if you're drinking enough. People like scientific tests. This is why people go running to the doctor, right? To see if you're drinking enough, look at the color of your urine. If it's the normal color shouldn't be dark. It should be almost colorless to light yellow. If it starts to be dark yellow or even orange in color, you're becoming dehydrated. It means that the kidneys are having to work hard to get rid of toxins in the body in very concentrated urine. And when I used to go to midwife with one of my kids, I remember doing a urine specimen one time and they said, we have never seen urine this clear. They said, everybody tells us that they drink lots of water, they said, but we can tell whether they're telling the truth or not. So this is a very easy way to tell if you're drinking enough water. Your urine should be quite, quite light to clear. On the urine test level, I would also suggest that if you want to, um, whoops, if you want to <clears throat> do some home testing. Urine tests are a good way to do it. They're not near as invasive as a blood test or something. And you can keep up with some of these things. A regular um, urine test can test for glucose, ketones, blood in your urine, protein, nitrates, pH, um, bilirubin and leukocytes and spe specific gravity. Some of those things may be interesting for you to know. So you're going to know the pH of your urine and that's going to tell you some of how well your body is functioning too and whether you're in a more diseased state or whether you're fairly healthy. So that's a good way to keep up. The nice thing about blood in your urine, this is one of the main reasons that I like these, is this is going to see the blood in your urine before you can see the blood in your urine, which is important if you ever end up dealing with something like leukemia. Okay, another important thing that people often go running to the doctor for is because they need an IV. This is how to make a home rehydration drink. And um, you, besides water, your body needs some electrolytes and you can make something that's going to be your kind of your electrolyte drink out of a liter of water, a half a teaspoon of salt, eight level teaspoons of sugar, and you also need which I would use the more natural sugar there. <clears throat> um, you can mix this, you can do some fruit juice in it or coconut water if you want. Also, if you're, whoever you're dealing with is not able to eat a mashed banana because you also need potassium, then you can make a tea with potato peelings for potassium. Potato peelings are very high in potassium and that's a good reason to eat your potato peelings. Okay. We're going to talk some about the external use of water. And I always like to go back to the Bible, see what the Bible says. God blesses this use of water, the picture of Naaman. We know how that turned out. This brings up a good point. Whenever we do a remedy with natural remedies, we always ask for the blessing of God because what happened to Naaman was maybe a water treatment, but it definitely had the blessing of God and it made all the difference. God puts the power in with your feeble efforts of following what he says to do. Okay, here's some reasons that you wanna do hydrotherapy. It increases the circulation of your blood. It stimulates your immune system so you can combat disease. It rids your body of toxins and it can be used for pain relief. This cup right here is actually the water after I did a fomentation under Trenton's arm. That's how much junk was coming out of his body after the chemotherapy. <clears throat> water is a good treatment because it's readily available. Basically, anywhere you go, if you are at the extension office, they have water. If you go to another country, Typically they have water, you may have to boil it, but they have water. People don't generally congregate in areas where water is not available. It's not near as hard to find as an herb or 
something else that you might use, which is a good reason to always know about hydrotherapy. And the other thing is, the things that you use for it, towels or whatever, are usually something you've got in your home already. Even if you're stuck in a hotel, this is one of the things I've learned, they've usually got a coffee pot there. Well, coffee pots aren't so good for coffee, but guess what? You can put water in there and it gets hot. So it's a, it's a great way to use a coffee pot. Okay, another thing that is important is that water is non-allergenic. Drugs are not non-allergenic. And maybe it's just me. This is actually a nice picture. I don't know, how, how many of you have heard of Steven Johnson syndrome? I had not until very recently when I had a friend write to me and tell me that one of the medications that they wanted her child to take had the side effect of Steven Johnson syndrome. And she said, if you Google it, you're going to know why I don't want to give this medication to my child. She said it was the worst death that she had ever experienced in her line of nursing. Now what they say, Steven Johnson syndrome is very rare, they say, acute, serious, and potentially fat fatal. It's a skin reaction which basically, in layman's terms, burns you from the inside out. All your skin burns off, but it's only... I mean, there's nothing externally burning you off. It is nearly always caused by medications. And I know many of you are thinking, oh, well, that probably comes from bad things like chemotherapy, right? Wrong. It can be to an antibiotic. It can be to something like ibuprofen and over-the-counter drugs. So when you d have a headache and you decide you want to go take a medication off the shelf, think that you could be, this, it says rare, but this says estimated to be one to two million each year. You could be one of those one to two million people that ends up like this. And like I said, this is a nice picture because I thought there might be children here. If you get one of somebody's face that's had this, it's even worse. People are dying of this and that is the main cause, is medication. So you start seeing why doctors are writing things about medications that kill. It basically, their liver can't metabolize the poison that's being put into them, as, as I understand it. So, when you think, that's one good thing about water. Water is non-allergenic. Might have some with chlorine in it, which you want to try to avoid, but most people can tolerate water. Water comes in three different forms. Every child learns that in school. Solid, liquid, and a gas. And that's one reason why it works so well for treatment. There's a little bit on the physiology of hot and cold. When you put the hot on, your blood vessels actually dilate. And when you put cold on, they actually constrict. And basically, this is going to make almost a pump action when you're doing a hot and cold. If you look in the Natural Remedies Encyclopedia that some of you saw in the back, there's a whole long list of what, these, what cold does and what hot does. And <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about a few here. Heat is going to increase your blood flow. Cold decreases the blood flow. Uh, heat increases the inflammatory response. Cold decreases the inflammatory response. That's why if you hit your head or something, you're going to put something cold on it. Um, it cold's going to also decrease your edema production, which is um, swelling, basically. Heat will increase that. Heat increases hemorrhage. If you're bleeding, you want to put cold on it, which decreases hemorrhage. Um, heat decreases muscle pain and spasms. Cold decreases muscle pain and spasms. Heat decreases stiffness and arthritis. Cold, as probably a lot of people that are arthritic know, increases stiffness and arthritis. And heat decreases the number of red blood cells, but increases the number of leukocytes. This is important to remember because if you are anemic, you do not want to do a lot of hot treatments, um, like taking a hot bath, because it will actually decrease your red blood cells. Um, if you're a normal person, it's not enough to make a big difference. But if you're anemic and you take lots and lots of hot baths, it can, it can cause a problem. So you wanna, one of the easiest ways to tell if you're anemic is to just look at the inside of your eye there. And it should be good and pink. 
Another way to tell is look at your nail beds. They should be pink. If they're not pink, you're anemic. Um, but cold, on the other side, increases your blood counts, and that includes your red blood cell count. So it's, and it's going to increase your leukocytes, which are your white blood cell counts, which gives you, um, boost your immune system. Okay, we're going to talk about several different hydrotherapy treatments today, and I'm not going to have time to go through them all. But we are going to touch on fomentations, um, contrast bath showers, which are hot and cold, um, neutral baths, cold mitten frictions, Epsom salt baths. There's lots of different things that you can do with hydrotherapy. And there's so much there. I've wondered sometimes why do they have all these different treatments. Some of them do different things. Some of them do essentially the same thing. But maybe it's what's available or what's easier for that part of the body sometimes. One caution is if you have diabetes, you're supposed to avoid hot applications to your feet or legs. And if you've been diagnosed with Renaud's disease, you're supposed to avoid the cold, avoid hot baths and saunas if you have diabetes, multiple sclerosis, are pregnant, or have high or low blood pressure, or cardiac problems. Start slowly with hot treatments as you can become exhausted, especially if you are very young or old. If you're dealing with somebody that's very young or very old, you want to moderate the hot and cold a little bit more. Maybe not quite as cold and not quite as hot. We talked some about a hot water bottle. Hot water bottle to me is one of the easiest treatments to do. You can buy one of these at Walmart. So you're just going to fill your hot water bottle two-thirds full. That way it's got some bend for wherever you want to put it. Put in the plug. You can use it wherever you want. If you live by yourself, this is probably one of the easiest things to do. Cold mitten friction. This is one of my favorites. This is the one that we got to play with so much in the hospital. Any of you that have watched Shop for a Cure will see how this will affect and raise your leukocytes, your white blood cell counts. It's used for restoring tone to muscles and blood vessels. It increases your, the functioning of your internal organs. It relieves muscle soreness and achiness. It increases resistance for colds and infections. It increases your white blood cell activity. It helps with poor circulation. Um, tobacco and drug withdrawal also, and it enhances your energy and endurance. And we're going to have Daniel come up so I can work on him. Diana, can you get put some ice in my bowl, please? Okay. When we do a, we'll switch here. When we do a cold mitten friction, you're going to take your patient and hop up here, Daniel. Hopefully you don't have to do it on a table at home because <laughs> you may have to lift them up. But you're going to take your patient, you're going to put um, ice in your bowl. I've just got an ice pack here, but you can put ice in your bowl and find a nice place to set that. You're going to want to keep your patient warm. <clears throat> Because you don't, even though you're doing cold, you don't want them to actually get cold. So you're going to have a towel for drying them off, set there. And you can make fancy mitts if you want, but I'm one of those that just does with what you've got at home. I just kind of take the washcloth, wrap it around my hand, or you can just hold it, however. And you're going to remove one appendage and rub it all the way up. You can work from the the bottom up toward the heart, the colder it is, the greater the reaction, and you just kind of rub until the skin's pink. Then you're going to take and dry it off good, and you're going to place that back underneath the covers. Are you cold yet? No. And then you're going to move on. So if you want to do a leg, you're going to find a leg under all those covers, pull out one leg at a time. You're going to do the same thing. Work from the bottom to the top. Just rub up the leg, get it good and have your water good and cold, and have them, um, probably feels good today, huh? Rub it good, 
and get it going. And then, whoops, dry them back off so they don't get cold. Now, cover them back up. Now, this is one of the important things. When you do hydrotherapy, whether it be a cold mitten friction, whether it be fomentations, you want to keep your patient warm, especially if they're already sick. In Daniel's case, he's not already sick, and that probably feels good. <clears throat> but this is going to boost your immune system. If you want to do it yourself and you're not already sick, if you take a hot bath, like I like hot baths, but I also tend to be slightly anemic sometimes, you can take your hot bath and give yourself a cold mitten friction afterwards to help your red blood cells perk back up. Um, when I do this, depending on how sick your patient is, I also oftentimes do their chest and their back. And when you do this, you can see um, on, on Trenton's blood test, you could see his white blood cell count jump up. It makes a huge difference. And it's very simple. It wasn't hard. OK, along with this, just yesterday I actually got this information. Atrial fibrillation. Um, there is a nurse that I was told about, and she had had atrial fibrillation for six years. She had tried, I guess, several different medications and had some problems with them. I'm not sure what they all were. but. So for six years, she was back and forth to the doctor with atrial fibrillation, and she wasn't able to deal with it. And then one day, she was reading uh, something in the Merck manual, I think, like a home manual or something, and she came across this, and it's actually hydrotherapy from the Merck manual, which is kind of surprising. But they said, if you have atrial fibrillation, which apparently is kind of like your heart firing improperly so your heart's not beating quite right and she said what she does when that happens now this is not a big enough bowl but she takes and she puts her face down in the bowl of cold ice water up to about her ears and it's a shock treatment and it actually caused the atrial fibrillation to stop it must reset something but it's so simple and she said since she's learned that she hasn't had trouble for about nine months because a lot of times this will land people in the emergency room. But for her, <coughs> there was no answer until she found a hydrotherapy treatment. Anyway, when she found this out, she's an RN, but when she found this out, she went back to her doctor and she said, hey, how come you didn't tell me that about this six years ago? So I don't know what they answered, but it's so simple that a child could do it, and it's amazing, but it works. Okay, fomentations with hot and cold. When you do a fomentation, again, you're going to want to make sure that your patient stays warm. Okay, as far as, as far as a fomentation with hot and cold, let's see what we can find here. Um, when you do this on a person's chest, which we're not going to do it actually on a person's chest today, but they would be laying down like this, and you would want to put a pretty good sized, cover up a pretty good sized part of their chest. And you would put this actually, obviously, straight on them <coughs> under here and cover them up. Because if you do this for pneumonia, if you don't keep your patient warm and you allow them to get cold, it's going to make it worse. If you're, if you're giving a fomentation, you have to keep your patient warm at all times. So if Daniel were getting a real fomentation, I wouldn't let him have his arms out like that. And actually, I did this a lot of times on Daniel. I'm going to do, in just a second, I'm going to call Dallas up, and I'm going to do an actual fomentation <coughs> on his arm to just give you the idea. But I did this a lot because Daniel actually swallowed the amniotic fluid and meconium before he was born, and he had a lot of problems with croup. And he would get to where he couldn't hardly breathe, and you almost think they're going to die, and I would do hot and cold on his chest, and it would clear it up and he could sleep. Thank you, Daniel. So we're going to do an elbow rather than a chest. I'm going to hope that this is hot. It's not very hot. Okay. Okay, when I do this, let's give you a 
how about a pillow under your arm there okay now when I do this I usually take a towel I'm going to use hand towels because they're easier to use your main idea is trying to use something that's gonna hold the heat longer so I usually do it I've I've learned to just take it and roll it and put it kind of like this into your pot of hot water which is not quite hot yet but and then you're going to also have your cold to rub them down with. And then, here, hand me one of these. To hold in the heat, you always want to cover it with something else to keep the heat or the cold in. Okay, so I'm going to take, this is not real hot yet, but it'll probably feel hot in this weather. So what I usually do is get these, get your water good and hot. You're going to grab the ends of your towel and I just, I just wring it out. A lot of people like to do this in the microwave. I detest microwaves and prefer to stay away from them. So I usually use, um, whoops, got my fingers stuck. I usually use the hot water and you're going to start with hot. So if you're doing a small child, you're going to want to test it on your wrist. Or if it's too hot, you can put something between it and their skin. Then you're going to cover it back up. And you're going to do that and leave it for about three minutes. The hot stays on for about three minutes. If you're ever dealing with a little person, I would sing a long song for the hot part. And then when it came time to do the cold, I would sing a short song. Um, so, okay, we're going to pretend that it's been three minutes. And I'm just going to use this washcloth, even though it's probably not quite big enough. So for cold, you can do one of two things. Okay, you're going to want to um, remove that, put the cold on. You want to warn your patient that the cold's coming. There was cold coming. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to leave that for only 30 seconds. So basically, you're going to put it on. You're going to grab your next fomentation, wring it out. Some people, if it's too hot, you can actually wrap it, put something underneath it, which this is not too hot, and put it and then cover it up again. Again, the hot stays for three minutes, the cold for 30 seconds. You always start with hot and end with cold. And basically, the things you have to remember, you can be all all professional about it but the thing you have to remember is number one don't burn your patient I have actually been burnt with fomentations before you want to test it if you have a small child I used to always just keep my hand under there and I could tell when it got too hot because sometimes after it sits it feels hotter so I'd keep my hand under there <coughs> um, the other thing is to keep them warm and to keep them calm and that's purpose of singing with little people Okay, we're going to go ahead and give him 30 seconds of cold here. Wool does have a good tendency to hold its heat a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Most people may not have wool on hand. So these are cotton towels. Um, the more, the more heat you want to hold in there, the more towels you'd have to put on top yeah. to hold in the heat. It works. So you've got 30 seconds of cold, and then you're just going to kind of dry them off. Now, I only did this twice. Typically, you would do it at least three times um, for pain relief. When I did this on Trenton, usually two rounds would take him down to where he could sleep, from a level 10 pain down to being able to sleep. <coughs> and... Um, 
I usually kept going. You can do it three times if you want. I got inspired by the um, story of, of Naaman and I often do it seven times, but, <laughs> but you can do it three. So there's multiple different ways to do hot and cold. A lot of us aren't going to want to do this real often because it is hard to wring out the claws. If you get your water just right, you can use your hands, but it's not going to be quite as hot. Um, <clears throat> another way to do this is to actually use your cold. And Diane, I think we're just going to use this because it's not that hot. Okay. Okay, I'm going to let you go sit down and I'm going to use Diana for a minute, okay? <laughs> okay, an another way to do this, if you're dealing with um, an injury or something, say it was her hand. Yes. I haven't dealt with a tennis elbow, but I wouldn't doubt but that it would help. It basically has... Helped. I have had people come up to me, in fact, when we were at the fair, I had somebody come up to me and they said that their husband had had tons of back pain. He even tried to take medications. The medications would never help, but when they did hot and cold treatments, it always worked. So if you're going to do it for the hand, you can do the same thing. You're going to, anybody remember, start with the hot so you're going to start with the hot. Is that really hot? Yeah, duh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it is hot. Okay. If it's too hot, then you can pour in a little bit of cold. Don't bring me. Okay. You can you test can it yourself. Hot. It is a little bit too hot. So here, we'll give you a little cold in there. How about that? Right. Okay. Get it where it's not too hot. Again, you don't want to burn your patient. You're going to do three minutes in the hot. And then about the time they get used to it, you'll stick them in the cold for 30 seconds. And then you're going to put them back in the hot again. And the hot, you've got to make sure it's the right temperature because after they've just been in the cold, the hot feels really hot, huh? But it, it brings good circulation to the area. Again, it works kind of like that pump with the constriction and then the dilation and the constriction and the dilation and it makes a huge difference in how how you feel. Okay, so we're gonna dry you off, Diana. You would do that again. You could do it three times. If you want to do it seven times, that's fine too. If you're doing it for yourself, it feels really good and it's, it's nice to do. But you could do that maybe if you've hurt your foot, if you've got some sort of infection, it's going to help um, to get things moving the way they need to be moving. So you can do that. This would be more like a bucket soak if you wanted to do your foot. You can also do a hot and cold shower. The same principle, three minutes hot. 30 seconds cold, just turn your shower one way or the other. In modern environment, that's easy to do. If you start getting sick, um, my sister-in-law does that very often. She'll do the hot and cold contrast shower, it's called. Um, and you can do fomentations to different places. Basically, if it's something easy to stick in a bucket, that's obviously easier. If it's your chest or your back, then it's going to be easier to do a fomentation. Now that we've taught you to be hot or cold, then there's neutral. Warm water does about one thing and it's called relax you and make you want to go to sleep. If you have a hard time going to sleep you can do a neutral bath. There are several different reasons you might want to do that and you can add stuff to it. If you're achy and your muscles hurt, you've been chainsawing all day or something, you can add some Epsom salt. You can get that at Walmart and put some of that, dump it in your bath water, and it's going to help you to, your muscles to quit hurting. If you do an Epsom salt bath for your muscles aching, you don't want to get out too fast. Don't get out and just go jumping around everywhere because your muscles are going to be very relaxed. So you have to baby them for a little bit, but it works. I also, um, I also have heard that this is, if in lieu of nothing else anyway, something that you can do if somebody has meningitis is put them in an Epsom salt bath. You um, can also do a, like a baking soda bath 
It's very alkalizing to your body. It's not good if you take it internally, but it's good the other way. It will help you to not be quite so acid. If you're itching and you've got bug bites or poison ivy or something, you can do an oatmeal bath. <coughs> you might want to put the oatmeal in just a little porous kind of bag and let it soak in there. So just to sum things up here, every true remedy is a picture of Christ. This is a good way to tell whether it's a remedy from the tree of life or from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. True remedies are a picture of Christ. And in Jeremiah it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. So Jesus is the living water. And instead of this, people have hewed out for themselves cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water. And this is what we see happening in the world. Not only do we see people drugging, running to the drugs in the pharmaceutical world when pure simple water could have solved the problem, we see people forsaking Christ for the pleasures of sin for a season. And I would encourage all of us to not only look for the natural treatments in the water, but to go to Jesus, the water of life.